All right, guys. I guess we're going to start. Um, the recording is I'm currently not on YouTube, but it's, uh, it's on the uh, MediaTek website. I mean, yeah, that's super helpful for the people who are watching the video. Um, the professor is not here this week, so TAs are going to do the next two lectures. So today it's me and Soham. Um, so um, is the, the sound working fine? Yeah, perfect. Uh, so now you should be all uh, perfectly proficient with uh, backpropagation. Uh, you've seen gradient descent as a, a general thing. Uh, you've seen how to apply it to a feedforward neural network. And you've started to see a little bit the problems that come with uh, backpropagation. So uh, next time, the professor mentioned that um, he, compared to the perceptron learning rule, sometimes backpropagation can't find the uh, perfect solution in terms of accuracy on the training set, but that it's uh, not necessarily a problem. It can be seen as a feature to um, enable more generalization and avoid learning outliers. Uh, now, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into problems of backpropagation, but this um, this um, lecture, we're going to uh, look into the problems of convergence. That is, um, next time you saw what can, be ha what can be wrong if we manage to get to a, loss, a minimum of the divergence. Today we're going to see if we can even uh, get to that minimum. Uh, and one kind of problems we're going to find on the way, what kind of solutions uh, we can uh, try to find for these problems. Um, so mainly the two problems are, uh, are we going to converge where we want to, and uh, how long is it going to be? Um, so if, if you wanted to do this analysis for a multilayer perceptron, it would be hard, because these are, as you know, it's a large class of functions that so is super hard to, um, and it's, it's super hard to do um, optimization with mathematical results on this class. So instead, we're just going to talk about con uh, convex optimization problems, uh, which MLPs are not, but you can consider the harder. So everything we say today is mostly correct, except for, back for neural networks, it's more complicated. Um, so basically, what we're doing is uh, look uh, where we are able to look, like, kind of like the guy who searches his keys uh, and just looks where there's light. So a convex function, uh, you know that it's convex when it's curving upward, or that you can also um, define as you take two, you take two for real valued input. Take two points on the surface, and you look at the um, segment between these two points, and it should be above the surface at any point. Or you can say that the slope is always increasing. There are a lot of definitions that all mean the same thing. Um, and there are a lot of uh, nice properties about convex functions, uh, one of them being they have only one minimum. So if you manage to get there, you're sure you're in the global minimum of the function. Um, so a neural, like, you can have non-convex function, obviously. And this, uh, at the bottom, you have an example of one. You can consider neural network um, error not to be a convex function of the parameters. So for gradient descent, what you uh, want is to converge to a solution. So you say it converges if you arrive at a fixed point. We're not going into the definition of limits of functions and everything. Basically, if you go where, you, where the gradient is zero or closer and closer to this point, you converge. What could happen is you're not converging, you're bouncing, like getting closer, uh, not getting closer just uh, bouncing around this, uh, this point, jittering. Or you can even uh, diverge. So there are uh, conditions to respect to avoid that it happens, because what you want is to converge, right? So uh, you can define, in convergence, you can define the convergence rate, rain, rate which um, quantifies how um, fast you get to your solution. So you define it as the 
relative rate of the dis distance between um, you and you where you want to go at, at the step and at the step before. Um, so if uh, this rate r is a constant or if it's like upper bounded by a constant, you're going to say uh, the convergence is linear, but don't get fooled by the name because uh, that actually means um, the speed you're arriving at the solution at is uh, exponential, not linear. So um, I said we are going to look into convex functions. For now, let's start even simpler. We're going to look um, quadratic functions, that is functions of uh, if uh, w is your parameter, you look at uh, double something times w squared plus something of w plus a constant. So if you apply, um, if you apply gradient descent for that, you're at some point, um, w, at the step k, you're at uh, wk, you look at the gradient at this point, you multiply by the learning rate, and you arrive at your next step, uh, wk plus 1. So the question is, what would be the optimal learning rate? Uh, in this, like, uh, ideally, the optimal learning rate is the one that uh, brings you directly to the bottom of the function. So for a quadratic function, it's actually super easy to figure out. Um, you know that you can rewrite your uh, coefficients of the quadratic function in uh, terms of the, uh, the derivatives, first and second, of the function. That's just a uh, Taylor expansion that I, I think you know about. Do you, do you? If you don't, you can, or don't understand something I said, you can raise your hand, especially if it's a mispronunciation problem. That can happen. Um, so um, if you write your quadratic function this way, uh, you can see that the minimum of the function uh, can be written um, as uh, um, compared to where you are, uh, compared to your point wk, you can uh, define it as the, depending on the, not only the gradient, so that is the first derivative of the function, but also the second derivative. So if you pick your learning rate as the inverse of the second derivative, you're going to arrive uh, exactly where you want in one step. So um, if you pick an uh, optimal learning rate as this, uh, yeah, very much. If you pick eta as the inverse of the second derivative in uh, wk, which is actually the second derivative for a quadratic is constant, right? Um, then at uh, step k plus 1, you're directly at your minimum. So um, it's not a very, very interesting problem to try to minimize a quadratic, fun quadratic function, of course. Um, but we are looking into this more like a, a tool to understand uh, gradient descent in a general way. So um, this is your optimal learning rate. If you're smaller than that, what's going to happen is you're going to um, get closer and closer to your, uh, mon mon monotonically, to your solution. If you're exactly that, you arrive directly there. If you're bigger than that, but um, slower than uh, the twice this optimal learning rate, then you're converging to, but by uh, bouncing from one side to another. And if you're bigger than that, you're just going to diverge. So that's what you want to avoid. Now, if you if we try to generalize that to uh, generate differentiable convex functions, not quadratic ones, um, you can pretty much do the same thing. You define the Taylor expansion, except this time it's uh, contrary to quadratic. It's not an equality; it's just an approximation, right? And you can define the with the same logic the optimal learning rate as uh, the inverse of the second derivative in WK. And uh, you are gonna actually going to get divergence in, uh, if you take something that's twice that. It's um, the, from going from quadratics to convex function is not really a proof. Uh, so like there's no, we're, we're, we're not um, 
proving that that's going to happen, you kind of have to believe us, but we're, it's um, intuitively you can understand why that's how it works. Because like a, a convex, you can see it as um, something that uh, locally looks like a quadratic. Um, now, if you look at functions of a multivariate input, more complicated, uh, but that's actually what you have in the neural networks, since uh, you try to optimize um, with respect to all of your parameters, so that's definitely a multivariate input. Um, so we can still look at uh, quadratics, except uh, this time the form of a quadratic is more like this. So it's um, wt times uh, um, dot uh, square matrix dot w plus w dot uh, a vector plus a constant. Um, so if we, um, for now, um, Let's look at the case where A is diagonal. You already, I mean, if you suppose your function is convex, you already know that A would be um, symmetric and positive definite. Uh, so that's going to uh, come in handy later. So if A is, in addition, diagonal, you can also say that the, um, say that in, uh, by saying that the wi are uncoupled. That is, you can uh, move them uh, independently from one another, and um, uh, it's going to be easier with uh, this curve. So basically, if you look at this curve, which is the equal value contour of um, your function, the axis, you can see that an equal value contour is basically an ellipse. And uh, the axis, oh, sorry? The axis of the ellipse are parallel to the axis. And in the form of your function, you can see that it's just a sum of independent terms that all depend on uh, wi. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's basically just a sum of uh, independent quadratic functions. So, um, if you were to take slices of your function, like uh, vertical slices like this, you'd get uh, um, you'd uh, get um, different uh, real-valued functions that are basically all the same but uh, separated by a constant value, and that works for horizontal axes either uh, as well. So basically, the descents. Uh, with respect to each coordinate are uncoupled. So if you were to optimize each coordinate separately, you'd get a different learning rates, and you could do that, and it would work perfectly well. Except that's not what uh, gradient descent does, right? Uh, in gradient descent, you'd get a vector update rule, which would look like this. Um, so from WK, you go to WK plus 1 by taking the gradient and moving, multiplying it by a scalar learning rate. And, um, and that's it. Um, so you update the entire vector in the direction of the gradient. So, and, and the gradient would be uh, perpendicular to um, the equal value contour. So you see that it's not going really in the direction of the uh, learning rate. Uh, um, of the optimum. The thing is, if um, there's a big issue with this kind of learning rate um, of descent, and that's that uh, what we mentioned for real valued input is still true, and you're going to want your learning rate to be smaller than the optimal learning rate. But if you don't want to diverge, it has to be smaller than the optimal learning rate for every coordinate. And since you have a lot, it's going to be smaller to twice this uh, uh, optimal learning rate, sorry. Um, but since you have a lot, uh, this is likely to be a very small minimum, and your convergence will be extremely slow. Um, and every time uh, the learning rate is uh, bigger than the optimal learning rate, but smaller than twice that, it's going to uh, oscillate in addition. Yeah. Uh, why, why is, why the direct, you said the direction is not uh, going to the minimum, because it's in the two sides previously, isn't it? 
Yeah. Correct. Why, why is that? Like, I didn't well, in a general curve, uh, if you take the gradient, it's leading to a direction where it descends. Uh, and uh, but there is no particular reason that if you follow the gradient directly, it's going to lead to the global minimum of the function. Um, so if you and one property of uh, the gradient, it's like that it's always perpendicular to the equal valued contour. Uh, so here, if you look at it at this valued contour, you can see that if you take the gradient at uh, the point where that we're giving, the direction is not at all the minimum, right? If it's infinite, you can say it that way, I guess. It would work if these ellipses were um, circles instead of ellipses, or that you can, um, if you look at the um, um, uh, definition of this uh, of this function, if all the a i i were equal or equal to one, then it would work. Uh, in general, it uh, that's uh, not how it works. That's not a big problem, right? Because you want to get closer to this step, in, to this uh, minimum in, uh, in several steps. Um, but the real problem uh, we have is more uh, the question of how fast you're going to get, and the answer is slow. Um, so these are some illustrations of what could happen. Uh, here you are looking at like uh, two-dimensional um, two uh, input with two uh, different optimal learning rates. Still core logic. Um, so if your um, the the minimum the biggest one is one, the smallest one uh, at uh, two optimal is uh, one third. So if you're a little bit above uh, the double of this uh, this second learning rate, you see you're bouncing out of the function. If you're exactly equal to that, you're oscillating without never getting where you. Um, in getting closer to the minimum. Um, the fastest that you'd go is actually like if you take, um, if your one point eta equals 1.5 this, you see you can get uh, fast uh, in the center pretty quickly. Um, but if you take exactly that, then you optimize the uh, second coordinate like super fast. But uh, the um, the 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 the, fir the the other coordinate is gonna be um, much uh, slower to converge, uh, and if you're smaller than that, it's uh, rough, like uh, it's even, even slower. So here you see that uh, taking uh, exactly the the opti one optimal learning rate is not gonna give you uh, the best solution you could. So you, the, the rules that were easy to understand in the real value case are not easy here. Um, so convergence behaviors tend to be uh, unpredictable, especially when you increase the dimension. There were a question? Yeah. Um, on that other slide, was one of those five you were looking at like optimal? It's kind of hard to tell. Sure. Uh, you wouldn't call it well, no, optimal, no. Um, if these are your options, I guess the, the best one is the, the one on the right. But um, that's just here. We're, we're going to try to make a general wolves uh, uh, that are better than this a little bit later. But if you want um, uh, learning, a good learning rate basically would have to be uh, close to all of your uh, coordinate learning rates. Uh, the thing is, if the... If the uh, um, the rate between the biggest one and the smallest one is uh, large, then you're not going to be able to do that, and you can only have slow convergence. Um, so the reason for this problem is that uh, this um, ellipses uh, give the equal value contour. They have axes of different uh, of different uh, length, and that results in different uh, and great for different directions. Um, and by the way, that is, we just uh, mentioned the case where A was a diagonal matrix, and that is when the coordinates are uncoupled. But if they are coupled, uh, the, the, the thing, it becomes even harder to, um, to, to, to figure out because you'd have to take a rotation of, um, 
of this uh, of this figure. And if you move in one direction, you can you change the gradient in uh, the other direction. So uh, things because become more complicated. So the solution you can think of is um, to normalize the objective so that you'd have instead of AFC, you'd have uh, circles. Uh, so you could that would be taking. Um, a change of variables uh, mathematically. So you're, you'd be looking for a, instead of W, you try to optimize a W hat that you can express as a linear combination of the elements of W and that you could optimize with the, um, the equation uh, at the bottom that is the equation of a, a nice paraboloid where the global value contours are just circles. Um, so if you look at the original uh, equation uh, with like by just uh, doing some uh, you're looking at a, a, a matrix S such that you could uh, get the equation at the bottom and it's pretty easy to find that uh, the S you'd get would be the uh, square root of the A matrix. Uh, so I mean square root in the sense of like positive uh, symmetric matrices. Are you, are, are you familiar with that? I guess. Um, so if, um, if A is diagonal, S would be diagonal to and it's just the, the, the square root of its diagonal elements. If it's not, then you, but you, you still have a square root uh, matrix and you can get your, with your updated um, with your updated uh, equation, uh, it's much easier to optimize because uh, now the learning rate is independent of direction. It's leading you directly to the, um, the gradient is leading you directly to the minimum. And you can find an optimal learning rate that would lead, lead you directly to the solution in the quadratic case, right? Um, <coughs> so if you were to express this equation back into the, um, um, the, the equation of W and not W hat, uh, what you get is that you have to multiply the gradient by the inverse of the A matrix of your equation. And then uh, if you do just that, the, optim the optimal learning rate is simply one, actually, uh, because that's uh, the equation on the top is your, is your equation. Um, so if you look at convex functions that are not uh, quadratics, you kind of can repeat the, the same behavior and you get a sort of optimal learning rate, except this time in term, um, you're going to replace A by um, the general uh, matrix of the second derivatives of your divergence, um, which is also called, uh, you've seen it a little bit uh, last week, the Hessian function of your divergence. Um, so if you just update by um, the gradient times the inverse of the Hessian matrix with a learning rate of one, you're gonna get uh, not to the uh, global minimum. Let's see what happens actually. Basically what you're doing is take uh, the uh, um, a quadratic approximation locally of your convex function you get uh, to the minimum of this approximation. And then you start again. And again. And you, you see that you, that's just an illustration, but here you'd get to the um, global minimum of your convex function pretty fast. So did we uh, solve gradient descent? No. Uh, you still have a couple of uh, very, very problematic uh, issues. Uh, and one of them is um, the Hessian function itself, which is extremely heavy to compute uh, because it has uh, its uh, number of parameters is of, uh, yeah, coefficients is uh, squ the square of your total number of parameters in your network. So if you take uh, just a network with simply like uh, 100,000 parameters, 
the Hessian matrix would have 10 billion items. Uh, and you'd have to man compute this matrix and then manipulate it uh, and uh, can consider that it's uh, unfeasible. And 100,000 parameters is basically what you have to deal with in homework one part one. So it's really not a lot. Um, and uh, you'd have to invert this matrix, more importantly, and that's not a trivial operation either, as you may have learned in an algorithmic class. Uh, the algorithms to do that are not linear, they are m more complex than that. Moreover, it's not, uh, you have additional problems. Since you're not in the case of a convex function when you're dealing with neural networks, you have like additional problem, one of them being that your Hessian function does not have to be positive uh, semi-definite. And if it's not, then uh, if you were to multiply the gradient by that, you could go in the wrong direction in some uh, coordinates, in the coordinates where the, um, in the directions where the eigenvalue uh, is negative. Um, you can understand that quite easily, actually. If you just take a one, uh, if you take a one-dimensional input and you went there, uh, your gradient would go this way, but your uh, curve at this, uh, in this section is negative, so if you were to multiply by the, the second derivative, you'd actually go this way. Um, but for uh, real, um, f for multivariate input, you can be sure that this is gonna happen in some coordinates all the time. So the Hessian is not, uh, you, can, you can't use the Hessian matrix directly, you'd have to look into the coordinates and avoid moving in the one, in the, the directions where the eigenvalue is negative. It's harder, that's what you have to remember. So uh, is what we did before completely useless? No, uh, you have several optimization algorithms that uh, are evolutions of gradient descent and try to approximate the Hessian matrix and uh, basically do um, kind of the same thing but with matrices that are easier to compute and manipulate. Uh, here are some you may have heard uh, before. Yeah, there's the BFGS algorithm, the uh, Levenberg Macar algorithm. You, you see them quite a lot in uh, machine learning in general, but in uh, neural networks, not so much today. Uh, you used to see them, now you, we find uh, more uh, stuff that seems to work better. So most of uh, what you're gonna see uh, next and uh, Wednesday uh, are examples of uh, algorithms that are um, uh, that apply well to neural networks. Other issue, um, the learning rate. Uh, so we saw that if you wanted to avoid getting uh, out of um, uh, getting away from your minimum, you had to have uh, a running rate that is smaller than twice the optimal running rate in this uh, convex curve. But since neural networks are not convex, actually getting out might be exactly what you want. Like if, you, if your initial point was like in this uh, area with this uh, local minimum, you'd uh, rather not get to this minimum, but have a learning rate that's big enough so that you can get out and get uh, to another uh, lower minimum. Getting to the global minimum in general is um, not uh, reasonable, but uh, what you want to, where you want to get is a good local minimum. Uh, so if you have a big learning rate, it can help you escape uh, local optima. Um, but if you had always a big learning rate, then you'd never actually uh, reach your local optimum, uh, your, uh, your an optimum. You'd uh, just uh, bounce around uh, and never converge. Uh, so you kind of have to find the happy balance between these two 
phenomena, phenomena. So what you usually do is just decay the learning rate. So you start with a large one and you gradually reduce it. So I have a lot of ways. Like here, uh, this uh, shows what will happen if you were to do that. Uh, so basically, that's, uh, that's what you want, right? You, you get out of the bad minimum and you went into a good minimum. So to decay your learning rate, you have a lot of ways to do that. You can do it uh, regularly at a, 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 pay, a linear pace, a chronologic pace, uh, several, um, several possibilities. What you will usually do in practice is simply take a constant learning rate, you train with it, at some point, you see that you can't, you don't, you stopped uh, getting better, your training loss or your validation loss more uh, better is uh, stuck. Then you just uh, divide it by 10 and you take, uh, you, you start training back where you stopped. And you do that uh, a couple of times, three, four, until you don't uh, uh, move at all. So that's, uh, it's not necessarily what's uh, best, but it's super easy to implement and it tends to work fine. So that's uh, where we are right now. We saw some of the convergence issues, some related to um, solutions and problems dealing with second order method. That just means using second derivatives. So that's all the parts with the Hessian matrix. and. Um, the problems related to the learning rates and how you can solve that. Um, so uh, that is all for my part. Who's doing next thing? Oh, we don't have so on. This is bad. I don't know where it is. Okay, we kind of have a problem of instructor right now. Um, you're familiar with AirProp? <laughs> okay, you can try that. All right, so this is a very good time to take questions uh, if you have some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In my experience, yeah. Um, I mean, if you take, for example, the homeworks in this uh, is this uh, course, it can make a, a, a fair difference. I mean, if you if you start with a super high learning rate, obviously you're not going to learn anything. Usually, you start with something like um, um, ten power minus two or ten power minus three, and um, at some point you stop uh, improving, and then you, um, the, the first time you're gonna decay your learning rate is gonna uh, bring some strong improvement. A second time can bring a little bit of additional improvement and then uh, you just get stuck in general. So yeah, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a theoretic tool, it, it actually works. Anything else for anything that was before? All right, so we're just going to see if we have a solution to this problem. Otherwise, I guess I'll... Yeah? I don't know if you have said this before, but how do you set your initial learning rate? I mean, do you will decay it? How do you set the initial Um, It's kind of a handmade tool I mean, um, I guess you could uh, if you if you know it's uh, you're evolving in the space with this dimension you, you you know what kind of running rates tend to work in this case um, usually um, 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 are the ones you start with uh, because there, there are 
small enough that you're going to get some initial progress and they leave the room for uh, decaying uh, a couple of times. All right, so I guess I'll just um, try to uh, go further. Uh, so if you take a step back, um, instead of, uh, we're going to see like a couple of algorithms that are um, doing something a bit different uh, from uh, gradient descent and are kind of better, are working better uh, with respect to the problems we mentioned. So uh, you saw that the problems arise because we, were, we, we need a fixed step size across all dimensions. And since you'd need uh, separate ones for the different coordinates, um, you, well, that's the, where the problem comes from. And that's why you need uh, to, to scale the axes and everything. Uh, if we, instead of scaling the whole um, space, we can just try to uh, relax these requirements and uh, see uh, algorithms that don't exactly use the, uh, the derivative of the whole function. Uh, kind of do that, but uh, not exactly, and tend to be uh, efficient for neural networks. Uh, these are not the ones you see the most in the literature, but uh, some uh, works tend to show that they work as well as anything else. So it's really worth um, knowing, know, knowing that they exist. So RProp is um, short for resilient propagation. It's a super simple uh, algorithm where you uh, basically follow a, a separate gradient descent for each of your coordinates. So at, um, no, no, okay, cool. Are you very familiar with RProp by any chance? <laughs> No, okay. I'll just run to, to keep on to keep up there. Um, so basically, what you do is at uh, each time you're gonna uh, go in the you, you you're gonna look at whether you went in the the right way or not, and uh, if you are you're just gonna uh, go the same way by increasing the step. And if you're not, you're gonna do, um, go reduce the step and go the reverse way. So it's kind of looking at whether you were doing a monotonic convergence, uh, in which case you can afford to go uh, faster, or uh, are you in a bouncing out case, in which case you want to go the other way, but, um, But uh, what was the thing? But uh, slower to avoid uh, getting out of your uh, of your minimum of the lo local uh, convex zone. So what you take is you select uh, an initial value, the value hat, and you take a step um, at first. Um, uh, yeah, basically you take a step in uh, the direction, general sense, of the derivative. Uh, but you, that's a single value. Uh, um, we're looking at it in the uh, one dimensional input case. So you take, uh, you go in the direction of the derivative, uh, but uh, at first you go in uh, this direction, and you see whether it reduced the function or not. So at the, that was, that's what you do at step zero. What you do at step one is, uh, if in the previous uh, case you were, um, uh, going in the previous location. 
if you were going in the right direction, that is, if your value decreased, then you're just going to go uh, this way, uh, but faster. So you multiply your, um, uh, your step size by like a constant coefficient, alpha, and you, you keep on. And you do that until you actually went, uh, got a bigger value at one step than you had at the previous step. So that means you're going, uh, now you're going the wrong way, so you just go back. Oh, you're even bigger now, so you're just going to go back the, the initial way. Um, so you have few parameters here. You just need the increasing coefficient alpha and the decreasing coefficient uh, beta, and that's about uh, that's about all. So as you see, you don't really need uh, to compute the gradients here, right? Because you, uh, if you're in a one-dimensional uh, case, um, you the, the gradient is just uh, the direction. The derivative is just uh, giving the direction. Here you have an, uh, the algorithm itself is going to tell you which direction to go. So you just need to compute the derivative in the initial step. And there, you just uh, apply the prop iteration, and uh, you don't need the derivative anymore. If you were, sorry. If yeah. You, if you don't calculate the derivative yet, how do you know if you're going still in the right direction? Uh, because you, what you use to know if you were in the right direction is not the derivative, but the difference between the value you had at uh, this step and the value you had at the previous step. Which, uh, so the, how call that? The increasing, uh, the, yeah, the, 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 how you call that? The increasing rate, yeah. Which is this thing that can be positive and negative and that the uh, derivative approximates locally. You just look at that and that's all. Uh, that's, uh, that's what makes the derivative in, uh, interesting. Um, the thing is, if you want to do LProp for uh, a multi-dimensional uh, input, what you do is just uh, apply the LProp algorithm for each coordinate uh, separately. And you do that until, uh, for, so for each of your layers, for each of your coefficients, you apply what we just said. And uh, uh, you do that until you appear to have uh, converged, pretty much. Uh -uh. Yeah, so as you see, you just, uh, you just used the, um, the backpropagation algorithm to compute the derivative at the initial step. And uh, then uh, you, you, you use our prop to do all the next steps. So um, the idea is that you do our prop for each coordinate, then uh, separately, and then you start again because, of course, you moved. Since you moved, it's not like you can uh, update the coordinates separately, and you're going to arrive at the min the minimum. Um, but let's say you have like a two-dimensional uh, algorithm. One, two. So that's how you start. So you apply, uh, you compute one derivative. You apply our prop to uh, w one, and w two doesn't change. Then you apply our prop to this one. And then back to this one. And you do that, and so you, to go from here to there, it's just one backpropagation and one, uh, and uh, several iterations of our prop until you reach some like uh, level of convergence where you don't uh, increase at all from one step to another. And uh, so this, which is 
actually simple and you'd expect not to be super efficient than to be actually uh, super efficient. And what's, uh, what is uh, great is that it is not even a second order method like uh, the Hessian thing. You just look at the increasing rate for uh, your function and it tends to be much better than uh, gradient descent. Mm. Makes me your assumption about the last function. Yeah, so you just, uh, you pretty much uh, don't uh, make any assumption at all. Uh, you don't even uh, need the function to be convex for this to work. That doesn't mean you're gonna get to the global minimum, right? But uh, you're gonna get somewhere and it tends to work. Uh, no, as for quick prop, yeah. Uh, so there may be a, a vector of learning which one for each dimension in R prop? Uh, keep a vector of language, you say? Because all the learning rates for different dimensions might be updated at different times. Which uh, means we'd keep not one learning rate, but well, you don't, for each dimension, right? You don't really keep them. You, um, since you, you're gonna modify uh, this coefficient with like its uh, step size that you have to remember, then you move to, uh, you, you, once you're uh, quote unquote done with W1, you update W2. But instead of like one, you would have N learning rates. Um, well, you can't really say that because it's, um, it's not like you move them uh, all, um, all together with separate learning rates. You just uh, use a, a so-called learning rate for this one, then you forget it and you move along to the, uh, to the, next, to the next parameter that you want to modify. And uh, when you go back for uh, additional updates of W1, uh, you start over. You don't uh, take back the steps that you, uh, the, 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 uh, alpha and beta that you remembered uh, from the initial uh, modification. Train each dimension separately? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, separately, but um, since they are not independent, that's why you have to uh, do that several times. Right. If you just uh, stop there, you'd not have reached uh, anything that looks like a minimum. But if you do that like uh, 10 times, 50 times, in the end, you're in something that looks like a minimum. So each time we only update one parameter? Yeah. And each time you update uh, one parameter, then the next one, then, and, and then you start over. And we only calculate the divergence, um, like the der derivative of the divergence with respect to these parameters. Yes. Um, but um, the thing is, if you want to compute the derivative of a parameter that's like on the first layer of your network, yeah. you have to do the whole backpropagation basically because uh, all of the coefficients on the, the second layers and the uh, later layers depend on this one parameter. Um, so you, in this uh, diagram, you compute backpropagation at every of this step. Here you do backpropagation once, here you do backpropagation once, et cetera, et cetera. So you do much less uh, backpropagation computations that you, than you would uh, with gradient descent. Other questions about our prop? So quick prop is, um, quick prop uh, is based on the uh, Newton updates. Uh, that is um, this uh, the gradient descent with uh, rescaling by the invert of the Hessian matrix, everything we talked about. Uh, there are just uh, a, few, a couple of uh, big modifications. One of them is dimensions are independent, kind of like our prop. Um, so these are two methods to kind of uncouple the, uh, the, uh, the coordinates. Um, so in quick prop, you just, um, you, you use the Newton update for uh, each dimension uh, separately. So you'd compute the um, uh, second derivative of um, the divergence with 
respect to, to uh, one of the WIs. Um, so this is actually, uh, you may think that if you do that for all of the parameters, you need to compute something that's as big as the Hessian, but that's actually not true. Uh, it is uh, less expensive to compute, even if it's not like completely obvious. And um, more importantly, uh, you, um, the reason it's, uh, more simple than computing second derivatives is that you're going to approximate that with uh, finite differences. Kind of, uh, in a way, what you did with R prop with uh, the derivatives, like you sort of uh, approximate the derivative by looking at if you, uh, by looking at the, uh, um, the finite difference between two values. With quick prop, you're gonna look at, uh, you're gonna try to approximate the second derivative the same way. But you still compute the, um, um, the exact uh, derivative, first order derivative, but you're gonna approximate the second one. So you do that pretty much uh, this way. You just, um, you compute the, um, uh, the derivative uh, the second order derivative is going to be approximated by the difference between uh, first order derivative at uh, wk and at uh, wk minus one uh, divided by the, uh, the difference between the two. So that's exactly what a uh, finite difference is. Um, so since you compute uh, the first order derivatives with backpropagation, uh, you don't need to compute uh, anything else. You just take, uh, you, so the difficulty is just that you have to remember uh, your uh, uh, derivative from uh, one additional step. I, is it uh, clear up until now? Basically what's amazing about this algorithm is that the, although that's not uh, necessarily what's uh, best for reasons that are gonna be clearer uh, Wednesday, uh, they are uh, very simple and uh, both uh, very efficient. So, yeah, so the, the, the first, uh, first order derivative is just a backpropagation and that's all you need. So here you'd use a coefficients that come from two different uh, iterations of backpropagation, the, the last one and the one before. Um, it's not that easy to use if with uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow or this kind of framework that are not really designed uh, for that, but it's, it's manageable. And if you were to do that uh, for one homework, there is a chance that it's, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna give good results. Um, so you can try. Uh, and uh, actually, if you manage to get a good result with that, it would be uh, quite interesting and there's, uh, there's room for a publication to do that, actually. Um, so it has uh, some problems, quick prop. Uh, it's uh, a little bit uh, unstable in the general case, so the non-convex case, but still it's, um, it uh, tends to be uh, very fast and to work in many cases. So, uh, so that's pretty much uh, where we are. So what we're gonna see now are, um, I think it's momentum, right? Yeah, you pitch. Okay, so the famous momentum that you've all seen in uh, homework one part one uh, is another way to um, solve some problems of gradient descent. So we go back on uh, regular uh, gradient descent this time. So you have, uh, Yes, yeah, so, so the solutions we mentioned uh, to have like a dimension independent learning rate, they, um, they are efficient for some reasons, but uh, um, 
still have some problems, like uh, the fact that you tend to oscillate in uh, the directions that you're not looking at at, uh, at some point. So um, one um, momentum is uh, a way to uh, keep track of the oscillations and of the general direction uh, you're going to and to emphasize the steps in the directions that uh, tend to, uh, in the previous, um, in the directions that uh, seem to converge. So it's kind of a memory-based uh, update of the on gradient descent. So the basic idea of the momentum is to keep a running average of all of your uh, past steps. The idea being that if uh, the in some in um, yeah, so you keep a running average uh, in every uh, uh, for every coordinate, right? It's uh, you keep a running vector average, uh, except in the directions where you had oscillations. The previous steps are gonna tend to uh, negate each other, so you by uh, by uh, keeping an, a running average, you're f negating the direction in the, the update in this direction. And you're just moving in the directions where you actually get some progress. So that's kind of the idea. If you, if you, get, uh, if you used regular gradient updates on uh, uh, a function with uh, equal valued controls like this, uh, most of the updates would be in the direction, uh, in the vertical direction, where you have little improvement. And if you use a bit of, you add a bit of momentum to that, uh, you're gonna emphasize the direction, the the updates in the direction that is uh, actually uh, making progress. So the yeah, the, the general direction of convergence. So you do that uh, simply by, uh, you maintain a running average as you, I mean, at this point you should be pretty familiar with that. So you, uh, to get the uh, steps in, uh, step size at W, at step K, you just multiply the step size at step K uh, minus, uh, K minus one. You multiply that by a coefficient called you call beta that's usually 0 0.9 but it could be it could be something else and you add to that the the step size uh, that uh, gradient descent gives you for step k and that's all it's actually uh, very simple and uh, it increases directions in the uh, it increases the step size in the directions where the gradient tends to stay the same size instead of uh, the ones where it flips. So the updated uh, gradient descent rule is super simple to, uh, to write. So that's gradient descent uh, in general, and that's gradient descent with uh, momentum. So barely anything changed. You just uh, have uh, the running uh, the running average to keep track of. Mm -hmm. So that just, uh, yeah. So if you look at uh, it more closely at the step level, here with uh, the momentum update, you it's kind of like you um, compute the gradient step at the current location. And then you add the scaled uh, previous step. You can do the opposite if you think about it. Like you compute uh, first, you move to uh, the you, you move according to the running average to a new location, and then you compute the step size um, from that point and. Uh, and you get the final step. Uh, so if you do that, it's a little uh, variation on uh, momentum that's called the Nestor's uh, accelerated descent. 
So you see, you extend the at iterative step, you extend the previous step, you look where you are, you compute the gradient there, and you get your final step like this. You just, uh, in the end, it's like you added the two. And uh, so it's uh, close to momentum. It just, uh, the difference is just where you compute your new gradient. So you, you have to slightly change the, um, the, the momentum, uh, the update rule for Nestor. So if you compare Nesterov and momentum, you see that uh, in a lot of cases, Nesterov tends to be actually better, interestingly. Uh, so it's, uh, it's actually not as uh, um, uh, common to find in, uh, in uh, uh, deep learning uh, frameworks. But it's, uh, there are reasons to believe that it's actually better. So where are we, I think? Yeah. So this was actually all for today. So the, what remain remains to see is incremental updates, which also called stochastic gradient descent, um, and how it's gonna, we're going to re revisit all, well, all that we've seen based on that and some tricks for generalization, etc. Uh, we apologize for the bit of confusion for the second part of the slides because, uh, yeah, that's not a part that I was supposed to do, but so, so may I have seen a little bit uh, drafty. Sorry about that. But if you have questions, we have still some time to answer it. Like, uh, technically, there, there, are, there are still 10 minutes of class. It's, um, but the thing is, um, it's not that it's uh, faster than gradient descent with the uh, Newton update, but contrary to the version with the Hessian matrix, quick prop you can actually compute, right? Because you don't need to compute the matrix of the second derivatives. So the difference is, um, is not in number of steps, but in the computational power you need to, to, to actually do it. That's a second order method, but with an approximation of the Hessian matrix. Kind of like the thing we mentioned, LFB, LFGS, etc. So there are a couple of uh, hidden slides in there to that the quiz will talk about. You should remember that. Hmm? What topics are these? Um, just uh, some additional problems with the Hessian. A little. It's it's not like a one big thing for this one. For the next uh, lecture, you're going to have a whole part about the uh, generalization of our prop that's not, uh, not uh, covered in the in lecture.